Good morning, all. Welcome to the webinar on technology-based career opportunities in healthcare. My name is Vishal Sena, and I represent Apollo MedSkills. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for their overwhelming interest and participation in this important webinar. We received lots of queries, but due to paucity of time, our expert speakers will try to address most of them in the next one hour. So today, I have got two eminent speakers with me, Dr. Shrinivas Rao Polizela, CEO of Apollo MedSkills. A little bit about his background. Dr. Shrinivas is a versatile and a multifaceted doctor who is an internal medicine specialist and a management graduate from ISB Hyderabad. He has over 20 years of experience in healthcare and he has worked with some of the leading brands like Siemens, Apollo Hospitals, Apollo Munich Health Insurance, Space Labs, and others. He's also a visiting faculty at IM Bangalore. And currently, he is the CEO of Apollo MedSkills. Apollo MedSkills, to tell you all, it's an Apollo Hospitals initiative in skill development. We also have another eminent speaker, Mr. Ram Tawa. Mr. Ram is the director of XLR, and he's the principal consultant data science and project management. Mr. Ram has over 25 years of experience in healthcare IT. He has done his MBA from IM Kolkata. I welcome all the participants and I welcome both the eminent speakers. Before I commence the webinar, I would request Dr. Srinivas Rao and Mr. Ram to give their initial comments about the webinar and the topic. Thank you. Hello, hi. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for taking out your time today to join this information session on uh, technology-based opportunities in healthcare. So um, we have seen in uh, reality that technology is presenting numerous opportunities for improving and transforming healthcare. We have seen technology transformation in many industries, for example, banking, the way we bank a decade ago and the way we are banking now, it's totally transforming. Now you have bank on your mobile. Similarly, the marriage industry, the Shadi.com and the Bharat Matrimony.com, when they started, they were very small startups. Now you see the way they have transformed the uh, kind of matchmaking industry and uh, healthcare is not uh, uh, kind of has not adopted enough so far but I think healthcare has some promising opportunities to be adopted uh, through technology and today through this webinar we will be discussing some of these opportunities and I once again thank all of you for joining the webinar. Thank you Dr. Shrinivas. Over to Mr. Ram. Yeah, thank you Vivek uh, and thanks for uh, thanks to everyone for joining this session. Uh, so, as uh, Dr. Rao rightly said, so the, how the technology helps, the trending technology, the modern technologies help uh, the healthcare sector and what are the various opportunities uh, in the context of these technologies in the space of healthcare sector. We'll be more than happy to answer all your questions, right? And this will be a quite informative sessions and it will be uh, giving you some ray of light, a ray of hope. Uh, pertaining to the job opportunities in the space of technology and healthcare sector. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Ram. Thank you, Dr. Shrinivas. So I'll uh, begin with some of the important questions, uh, Dr. Shrinivas and Mr. Ram. Uh, since we only have one hour, uh, just to give you an update, I received a lot of questions. About more than 200 questions were received. So I've tried to collate all these questions into some of the important ones. So I'll start off with those questions and then probably we'll also take some live questions during the call at the end of the call. So the first question goes to you, Dr. Shrinivas. Could you please uh, give your insights uh, as to how technology is being used in healthcare today? And uh, post COVID, how do you foresee uh, technology transforming healthcare? Excellent. Um, thanks, Vishal. I think it's a good question. So if you see in India, uh, traditionally, if you see the trend of use of technology in healthcare, so it was predominantly limited to use of medical devices, like using digital x-rays, using CT scanners, the MRI, the ultrasound for scanning, and very limited usage of softwares within healthcare, like use of electronic medical records, that too, in, um, in silos, like most of the private hospitals, their EMRs are not connected, so the hospital information systems are being used, but again in silos, so then radiology information systems, the picture archiving and communication systems in radiology, the decision support systems, and very sparsely the telemedicine as well. Post COVID, I think uh, one of the blessing in disguise uh, during the COVID era, I think healthcare industry started embracing the technology at much faster pace than what is anticipated. Remember, it is not just healthcare industry. The consumer of healthcare should also be comfortable 
and it should be satisfied in using technology. What do I mean by comfortable and satisfied? I'll just give an example. For example, the telemedicine as a technology has existed for the last three decades, but its adoption increased more than 100 fold post COVID 19. So when I say that, in Apollo hospitals, we had about 200 to 250 consultations through uh, telemedicine in the past. Now we have close to 3,000 consultations each day. So the reason most hospitals, though they had telemedicine, but it really didn't scale up, it was because patients were not very comfortable meeting or consulting a doctor online. So now I think the trend has changed. As the consumer behavior is changed, obviously the hospitals and the uh, clinics will start adopting telemedicine. This is one change, major change that we have seen. Similarly, I think we will, robotics also existed. Robotic surgery was there for a decade now. So it's used in precision surgeries. and uh, But its usage was limited to a few areas, like in oncology uh, for a precision, precision uh, radiotherapy, we were, uh, pinpoint uh, radiation therapy. And for few surgeries, uh, robotics was used. But again, the cost of technology, if you bring technology, the cost of the procedure is going to rise. That was a fear amongst the healthcare institutions. But now, for us to get affordable technologies, I think the technology innovations and usage both should get scale up. When both of them scale up, then the economies of scale will apply and then the price will come down. So obviously, I'm forcing a big revolution of uh, technology within healthcare. Some of the areas in which we see a we will see rapid strides going forward, not very far, maybe a year or two. We will see a big data revolution in healthcare. We will see robotics uh, in healthcare reducing the human touch points, uh, whether it is registration of patients like in administrative areas, security, thermal screening, and even in the clinical areas, uh, you will see a lot of robotics coming in. And then artificial intelligence and machine learning, the data that is there will definitely uh, be improving and transforming the analytics in healthcare, be it predictive analytics in diagnosis or the decision support for doctors. I think there are a lot of changes that we see through artificial intelligence and machine learning going forward. And you'll also find uh, that there'll be a rapid progress in the tele technologies, uh, not just transforming the tele consultations, but also tele radiology, tele surgery, tele pathology. I think you will see a surge in those new technologies. So these are broadly some of the changes that I foresee, um, Vishal. And uh, probably as we go along in this webinar, I think um, I'll talk more about these technologies. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot, Dr. Shinivas. Uh, Mr. Ram, uh, there have been a lot of queries related to data science. If yeah. you could please uh, enlighten our participants in terms of what is data science and a lot of the participants are from clinical backgrounds. So could you please uh, help in telling what is data science? And what are the benefits? Yeah, sure. So data science in a layman term, if I have to say, is the study of data. So there's nothing new in terms of the basics of what data science is. It's all about analyzing the historical data. Analyzing the historical data and taking the informal decisions which has been happening from times immemorial, right? So even from a small uh, street hawker also will analyze the data, right? Probably he may not have a documented data. Probably he do a mental math or mental analysis. He will do a particular vegetable. What type of vegetable will be sold on Monday? Right, being a non day, what type of vegetable will be sold on Sunday? Right, in which area in Chubli Hills, what kind of vegetables will be sold more in posh localities, in middle class localities? He also he will also analyze. So, but the precision of his analysis and the insights what he develops out of this analysis may not be so great. So with the state of the art tools, we analyze the data. Data science is nothing but an an analyzing the historical data and developing the insights, right? And based on that, building the prediction models. So building the prediction models for the future. So you take the historical data, analyze it, and you predict the future. So let me take an example of the on the clinical side, on the medical side, so that people will understand it more easily. So let the uh, Assume that we have taken the genetical data or the genome data of a patient, of a person. So we analyze the data and we develop the insight and we predict what are the chances for this person to get cancer or diabetes in the future. Right? This is one of the applications of data science. 
So I am saying that this is a very primitive activity what businesses were doing or what the domains, various domains, the experts in various domains are doing. Then what's new? Why there's a buzz in the market about data science? Why everyone is talking about data science now? So analytics or data analysis is a primitive entity. The way how they have been analyzing the data, that state of the art tools, what they have been using now, it's a the complete sea change. What's the state of the art tools, what we have been using. And with the machine learning techniques and the algorithms, what we have been building. So there is a revolutionary change in the way how people are analyzing and the way how they have been predicting the uh, future with a precision, right? the kind of precision with what they have been predicting. So there is a revolutionary change. And also with the kind of volumes of digital data what we are getting, right? the need for this data science is increasing in variable. The data that got generated in the last two years is equivalent to the data that got generated since the inception of mankind. It means till 2018, whatever the data got generated, right, in the last two years, the volume of data is equivalent to that. If in the last two years, if this is the volume of data we are talking about, just imagine what would be the humongous data that's going to get generated in the future, right? So, right. Right. and, and uh, this is what all about data science, using this state of the art tools, technologies, and analyzing the data and understanding the insights of the historical data and predicting the future. And this is all about data science, try to say in a nutshell. Yeah. Right. Thanks a lot, Mr. Ram. So, Dr. Shrivas, my next question is uh, what do you mean by data revolution in, in healthcare domain? Because a lot of people are talking about uh, IT interventions in healthcare. So, what do you mean by data revolution? Could you please expand on that? Yes, uh, Michal. I think uh, Mr. Ram has answered uh, a part of it, but I will only apply the clinical side of it now. So what yeah. is clinical data? So for all the clinicians who are there on this webinar now, we all know that clinical data, where does this data reside? It decides in doctor's prescriptions. It decides in the discharge summaries of the hospitals. It decides in the medical diagnostic reports, the X-ray reports, the CT scan reports. And you'll also have a lot of demographic data, like where does this person belong to? What is the age group of this gentleman or this lady who's coming to the hospital? So there's a lot of data. The data is in the form of text. It is in the form of numeric and it is in the form of image. The text data, the text data is something like, okay, a 65 year old man coming with acute pain in the right side of the abdomen and he has got vomiting, he has got fever, he has got say a series of symptoms that is the textual data what is numeric data numeric data is say his blood pressure is 120 by 80 or his blood pressure is 180 by 100 and his uh, pulse rate is 92 this is a number so there's a numeric data and there is also an image based data what are the image data the x-rays that you see the ct scans the mri scans these all are images so what happens this data currently is residing in hospital on the hospital servers there's a humongous amount of data available in healthcare on these servers. So what, as Sram said, what is data analytics or data science? So now the data that is available on the servers, first it needs to be clean. When I say clean, you need to use, you need to segregate the right data. So you need to clean the data first, then you need to archive it. What do you mean by archiving? Storing. So when you, traditionally we were storing this data on hospital servers. But going forward, we will start storing this data on cloud. So once you start storing data on humongous amount of data on cloud, we call it as big data because there's a huge data available. And then the data that is available now will be analyzed. How do you analyze the data? You will analyze the data because it is sitting on a machine. If it's sitting on a cloud and it's a server machine, the machine has to learn this data. That is called machine learning. So how does machine learn that data because you apply an artificial intelligence how does our brain learn that data because i studied medicine i know that okay a person coming with fever a person coming with right side abdomen pain a person coming with vomitings most probably it could be acute appendicitis so this because i am making permutations and combinations of symptoms and with my natural intelligence i am diagnosing a patient if the same intelligence is learned by a machine that is called machine learning and if that learned intelligence is applied on the data and converting that data into meaningful data that is called artificial intelligence 
So if the data is secured, that means because healthcare data has to be secured. You, no one wants to know the health status other than family members. They don't want to make, make it public. So you need to secure it. That's where these technologies like blockchain uh, will come and secure this data. So all this is still nascent in healthcare industry, though it is widely applied in banking and other industries. Because it is very nascent in industries, the healthcare industry, there's a tremendous scope, new opportunities that will come up in this area. So this is broadly uh, more on clinical side of what is data revenue. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Dr. Shinivas. So Mr. Ram, my next question is, uh, are these programs in data science only relevant for engineers or is it useful for the management graduates, clinicians, and other categories as well? Could you please throw a light on that? Yeah, sure. So this data science is relevant to all the domains, irrespective of the domains. Like as Dr. Srinivasrao said, data science is being applied in all the domains, be it banking sector, financial sector, uh, the supply chain sector, you name it. You name it, any domain under the sky, there's not, the, the application of data science is very much bad. And uh, same is the case with the health. So when coming to the things that are required to become a data scientist or to learn data science or machine learning, people from any domain can try for it. It's something that like, people from engineering background or especially from computer science background with a programming background when they should pursue this course, it's not the case. Of course, it uh, makes the job easier. You know, when compared to a computer science graduate, a doctor pursuing data science, of course, he has to put some efforts. Uh, because this data will not be strong when it comes to the little bit of programming what we use in data science. But it's not a rocket science that one cannot mark. Though we use programming in data science, data science is not all about programming. You are not going, uh, not going as a Java developer or a Python programmer. You are not going. We use program, a little bit of programming we use it in order to analyze the data. See, even in Excel sheet also, we have to write a little bit of program or a formula, what we call it as, right, in Excel formula. So if you want to analyze the data, you have to do simple board mass, like you know, the division, subtraction, multiplication, addition, something you have to do. So you have to give some instructions to the structure what you are being using. So that normally we call it as commands. So we use a little bit of programming or command to analyze the data, to build the algorithms. Right? So with little bit of effort, people from any background can master uh, data science and machine learning or computer. The only thing is people from non-technical domains, you have to put more efforts. Normally, let us say a computer science graduate, he takes 10 hours mm -hmm. to master concepts. A non-technical graduate like our uh, clinicians, they may take 15 hours. Except for that, it's not a rocket science that one cannot master. Right? So people from any background right. can pursue this. And the greatest advantage what these clinicians or domain experts have is the domain knowledge what they have, which the computer science graduates or engineers, they don't have it. Let us say you want to analyze some patient's data and you want to predict what are the chances for this patient to get cancer or diabetes in the future. So if you ask the data scientist to take the data and to analyze, you don't know what parameters he has to choose in the, uh, of the patient. Whether the patient's age should be considered, his father's age should be considered, his father's history should be considered, mother's history should be considered, or maternal uncle's history should be considered, right? Whether diabetes diabetes related issues are considered he will not have any idea what to be considered he can write only a piece of code end of the day you need the subject of expert a doctor or a clinician right who throw some light related to the technology learning what if the domain expert himself does it there's nothing like that no you know in and out of uh, this uh, the domain knowledge will have a complete domain knowledge so it will be a piece of cake for him if he knows his data science concept he can do it from the start by himself Right. So that way, domain experts is out of demand in the market when than considered to pure data scientists coming from technical background. So a domain expert, let us say, chartered accountant, is has is learning data science. So he's, there's a lot of demand for type of blend for the, for type of mix. A chartered accountant doing data science, a doctor doing data science, a supply chain specialist doing data science, a financial expert doing data science. There's a huge demand in the market when compared to exclusively the, 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 the technical guys doing uh, data science. So that way, any, any any person with any background, but a little bit of analytical skills, right? And a good learning go towards mathematics is recommended. Right? Normally, we have two categories of students in school, people who hate math and people who are, who are good with math. 
people who are good with math or above average with math, right? And with good analytical, logical, and reasoning skills, they can pursue data science with a little bit of effort. Yes, initially there may be some difficulty they may encounter because of their non-technical background, but if they can uh, sustain the momentum and learn, definitely it will be a great advantage. Thanks a lot, Mr. Ram, for an elaborate uh, response to that. Uh, Dr. Shirivas, I would uh, like to uh, ask a related question. In, term, uh, in terms of job opportunities in the healthcare domain, and uh, what all verticals uh, do you see uh, which will require such people who have done such programs? Uh, since you talked about technology transformation, could you please highlight the job opportunities after this transformation uh, takes place? What could be the career opportunities uh, which some of the students can undertake? Thank you. Um, Michelle, is this question to me because I had a small yes, yes. disruption. I'm yeah, sorry. to you. Yeah. yeah, so that's from a healthcare yes. perspective. You, you want me to repeat uh, the question? You're asking uh, what are the job opportunities that uh, this technology transformation will yes. open up? That what in the healthcare okay. domain? Yeah. Okay, okay, fine. I think there are a lot of opportunities that um, the technology transformation will open up going forward. Um, one is definitely the data scientists and data analysts. Uh, so this, when I say data analyst, the data analyst is not essentially an engineer, uh, as Ms. Ram said. So you you will require a domain expert. So in, for example, in case of healthcare, if you are you really have to analyze uh, uh, a hundred thousand X-rays or two hundred thousand X-rays, um, then you need to apply. You you need to build a data analysis. Then you need a radiologist, a radiology technician to do a data analysis. I'll give you an example because this is an example that has been uh, materialized and it's a case study. You see, in the rural primary health centers in India, suppose if an X-ray is taken earlier, the, the reading time of this X-ray, because there are only uh, less than 2,000 radiologists in India and uh, you have 1.3 billion population and you have close to 250,000 primary health centers and every day there will be close to 200,000 x-rays that will be taken in these PHCs. So how can this less than 2,000 radiologists uh, read those x-rays? So the, the x-ray reporting time, the turnaround time was close to three to five days earlier. Okay, now what happened? An artificial intelligence was applied on these x-rays. Okay, so there are 200,000 x-rays, normal and abnormal taken, feed it into the system and the system now knows which is a normal X-ray and which is an abnormal X-ray. So out, out of every 200,000 X-rays that come out of these rural health centers, the system itself will filter off 90% of them as normal. Okay, So the normal X-rays are on the screen. So the abnormal one goes to radiologist for a further diagnosis, whether it can be tuberculosis, some consolidation in the lung. So what I mean to say is data analyst. When I say data analyst, it's not just an engineer who is coding who can become a data analyst. It can be a chartered accountant, it can be a doctor, it can be a petroleum expert. So the data analyst can be anyone. This is one role that will open up very fast and people who do this program quicker will have an edge. The second role that I'm anticipating and which will soon come is telehealth coordinators and telehealth assistants. If you see, um, with rapid adoption of telemedicine technologies, you need a facilitator between a rural PHC and a doctor who is sitting in a tertiary hospital in, say, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Delhi, or Chennai, or major cities of India. So for that, you need someone who knows that uh, technology bit and a little bit about the clinical side on how to keep the patient uh, sitting in front of a telemedicine setup and things like that. So these are telehealth coordinators. When the data analysts can be domain experts who will take this, the telehealth coordinators can be someone who is at 10 plus 2 level, biology level, and then he wants to start his career for learning. Then the third uh, openings that I see is in lot in artificial intelligence because once the domain expert gives the knowledge that artificial intelligence need to be coded. Okay, there, there are a lot of languages available for AI coding, which Mr. Ram may speak, but the healthcare AI is something that may come up soon. Then the fourth area I see uh, where there could be a tremendous opportunities will be in the area of medical coding because. Um, you know, government is implementing Aishman Bharat. What do you mean by that? That means there will be a free healthcare delivered for all the citizens of India. When it's a free healthcare, then you, there are a lot of claims that will come. 
So how are these claims analyzed? Earlier it was through manual effort. So doctors and nurses reading those claims and then settling them. But going forward, just like US, or UK, or any other countries which have adopted universal healthcare, we will also start doing ICD and CPT coding. What is ICD? International Classification of Diseases and Common Procedural Terminology. So these codings will this coding will be applied to the medical diagnosis and the treatment. So the medical coding will be one area where there will be a lot of opportunity. Then you need to equip all the home health aides and nurses and the existing doctors on how to use technology. Because in our medical schools or nursing schools or even the paramedical schools, we are not taught how to use technology. So there's a rapid upskilling required for the existing doctors, nurses, and um, the technicians and the technicians as well on how to use how to use the technology and how to adopt it. So there are a lot of opportunities opening up, job opportunities. Uh, because of this technology transformation, both in new skills as well as upskilling the existing individuals. So this is a broadly a snapshot, but you all can get into ApolloMedSkills.com website and see uh, all our latest programs that we are offering uh, in the space of uh, healthcare management and healthcare technology. You would find a wide, wide array of programs uh, targeting this. Also, Dr. Shivas, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Also, I wanted to ask a related question in terms of what is the government's role in this and how is government looking at uh, this, this aspect of uh, technology transformation? Okay. No, I think government has really played a very, very key role from uh, last year onwards in order to thrust the uh, technology, based, technology adoption in healthcare. If you see July 2019, July 2019, uh, the Government of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has released a document called National Digital Health Blueprint. It is released in the public domain in July 2019. So anyone, everyone on the webinar, after this webinar, you can just Google what is National Digital Health Blueprint. It is available in public domain now. So it is laying out the building block for implementation of National Health Stack. Which aims to deploy, which this is to aim to deploy artificial intelligence in leveraging the existing health record, both in government and private space. So the government has already taken its first step. It has defined regulations on how to apply artificial intelligence on health records, how to anonymize data, and how to link multiple databases to generate a greater data, a granular data, where the public and private sector data can be used. And this data is not just useful for the analysis of healthcare uh, data. It will also be useful for insurance companies because you will know in which part of India there is a higher incidence of heart attack, in which part of India there is a higher incidence of thyroid disease. So this blueprint for uh, the blueprint proposes a national digital health mission now. Uh, so I think the government is very actively pursuing it. I think post COVID this will be more accelerated now. Uh, so there will be a personal health record for every citizen of India and there will be an adoption of open standards by everyone and there will be a rapid healthcare data analytics collection, medical research. But the challenge is we do not have enough health, enough resources who can actually do that. So there is a need for human resources for implementing this uh, blueprint. The second uh, activity that the government has done, one is the National Digital Health Blueprint that I've just told. The second one is the National Telemedicine Guidelines that is released by Niti Aayog in March 2020. It's just released three months back. So earlier, the doctors and the healthcare institutions were very skeptical in adopting telemedicine because there was no legal regulation, there was no law governing the telemedicine. But now with the release of this document, there are very clear guidelines on how the telemedicine practice has to be done, how a doctor can consult a patient over telemedicine, what are the patient rights, what are the doctor's rights? How the data has to be stored? So there, it's a very clearly defined document. The only one, one thing that needs to be looked into that document is today, the telemedicine will not allow you to apply artificial intelligence on it. Okay, but soon, maybe I think six months from now or a year from now, we can start applying artificial intelligence even on the telemedicine data. But at this moment, there's a strict no from the government. So this is the second government step. One is the National Digital Health Blueprint. The second one is the National Telemedicine Guidelines. The third one is the rollout of Aishman Bharat, which is a national um, Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana, PMJAY. Uh, the scheme was launched in 2019. I think this 
uh, the, for implementing this scheme, you need to have a rapid adoption of technology, both by private, public sector, as well as the consumer, the patients themselves. If you see the number of um, downloads of Arugya Setu app, okay, that's the fastest download of any app in the world now because everyone is now mandated to download it. The similar revolution will happen on a healthcare personal health record app also, which may come soon. And uh, the consumers will also have an app of their personal health records in their mobile phones going forward. So uh, the government is playing a critical role. That's what uh, the point that I want to emphasize upon. Yeah. Right. Thanks a lot, Dr. Shinivas. Uh, my next question to you is, Mr. Ram, uh, which many of the participants have asked, in terms of what are the technical skills which are taught in uh, AI, machine learning, uh, blockchain, or big data, etc. So some of the skills, if you can just highlight, which are taught in these courses. You're right. So when it comes to data science, there are a few uh, tools which are there in demand. So there are many tools which you use for data analysis. Uh, for example, even Excel sheet is also a basic tool for you to analyze the data. But the major tools which are very uh, trending in the market and which are very handy in the market in the space of data science is one R2. R2. So R programming or R2. R programming, though we call it as a, as a programming, it's not a typical programming language like a Java or .NET. It's more of commands, like in Excel, we have commands, right? Multiply this way, this, right. sum of this, this. So if you know how to write a sentence in English, yes, you can write our programming with our commands. And of course, Python is also very, very useful uh, programming language. But when I say Python, you need not learn the entire code Python. Remember, Python is a very versatile programming language. You can uh, build mobile apps, you can build websites, you can build big portals using Python. So similarly, you can use for data science as well as for artificial intelligence to build the algorithms using Python. But the classes what you use in Python is hardly 15 to 20 percent of the total Python. It's not even 10 to 15 percent of the total core Python. So R and Python are the most happening. Of course, there are many tools like SAS is there. So, so but SAS is more uh, it's in the diminishing state, I would say. Uh, whereas R and Python are open to free tools anyone can use. So they are gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, not only that they are open source, they have the capabilities better than the corporate tools that we have, we have to do this. Like that. And uh, tools like Tableau, uh, one should learn for data visualization. Tableau is a reporting tool. See, once you analyze the data using R and Python, then what are the findings you have that you have to show to your management or to your customer or to your decision makers in the form of a report? So tools like Tableau will be very handy. That's why we visualization tool will be taught. And a little bit of knowledge on Hadoop, because the Chinos are saying mm -hmm. that the data that's getting generated, the volume is so humongous that now we're calling it as big data. Big data is nothing but huge volume of data. There traditional databases like Oracle database or your Excel sheet, they cannot act as repository. They cannot withstand that huge volumes of data. So they store this data in the uh, a huge word on, we can say in a layman language, or a huge big database called Hadoop. So, knowledge of little bit of Hadoop is required because as a data scientist, you may connect with Hadoop and you may import the data and you may work on it. Or you may connect to an Excel sheet, import the data and work on it. Or you may connect to an Oracle database or a data warehouse. And tool. So, you may connect to any data repository, extract the data, and you may work on it. So you should have a little bit of knowledge on tools like Hadoop, which will be taught as part of this data science program, right? And also SQL. SQL also is a very. I'm not talking. You should know the entire SQL program. A little bit of SQL uh, commands and all these things you need to know, because SQL you you know how to connect using this SQL program and how to fetch the data. What what kind of data you need to fetch? For example, I want data. Pertaining to April 2019 to September 2019, only six months data. That too related to the patients of the Pradesh. So this is the data that I'm looking for. Right? So you have to write a small SQL query. You will go and test that that particular data. See, so we have pharmacists here, no? If the Apollo medical medical shops are there. So if someone asks, oh, I want this medicine, they know where exactly that medicine is there. No? They will go and get you that particular medicine what you have been asking for. Similarly, the exact well, the, uh, the collection of the block of data, what you want, to SQL is going with. So tools like R, Python, Tableau, and uh, Hadoop, and uh, SQL. So these are the 
a few things which you need. Uh, there are many other things also, but these are the tools which are in uh, good demand. These are technologies which are in good demand. And again, I am saying, when I say you have to learn these technologies, you need not learn these technologies to the core. Only in the context of data science, whatever the extent what you need to know, you'll be learning only to the core. Yeah. Right. Thanks a lot, Mr. Ram. I would also like to ask you uh, if you could just give some insights about blockchain, because a lot of people are, are also asking about uh, what is blockchain. So that would be nice if you could just briefly explain that. Yeah, sure. See, blockchain is a distributed public ledger where you record the transactions and you will be helpful to record and track the transaction and assets as well. So in blo blockchain, I think that no ordered records arranged in a block structure. So each data block contains some fingerprint or unique identifier or a hash, time-stamped batches of recent transactions and a hash of the previous block. So this design, each block is connected in a chronological order and the connected blocks are called a blockchain. It means the data sets are connected with each other and each data set we call it as a block, right? So some, some a set of data is called as a block and you have another set of data is called as another block and they are all connected with each other. So it's impossible, it's impossible to, uh, what do you say, uh, manipulate or to change the transaction what you have done in a given block. Let us say you change some information in a, in a, in a for example, in the MS Word document you made some change. So when right. that change it was was done you have a stamp over there right if someone has to change that stamp there is a chance that they can uh, change the time stamp right at what date what time you have made the change with blockchain it is impossible that a change is done a time stamp is done it's done you cannot change so that way blockchain is a very very secure technology Right, which is taking uh, 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 a lot of leap, a uh, uh, big leap in the space of uh, different domains, and so is the case with medical technology as well. So, blockchain technology is expected to improve medical record management and also the insurance claim process. It will accelerate the clinical and biomedical research and advance biomedical and healthcare data ledgers. As uh, Dr. Rao was saying, there's a lot of data that's getting generated right, with each patient, and if you store it, you, you store this data online. Right, so this data should not be changed, it should not be manipulated, it should be secure. Mm -hmm. Right, it's done how, how who did it, when it was done, a complete history has to be maintained. So, with this blockchain technology, uh, it is very much possible. Having said this, blockchain is in very, very nascent stage in the in the, in the uh, context of medicine. I would say so, uh, you know, cryptocurrency in financial sector, yes, blockchain is doing well. But in uh, medical uh, domain, blockchain is in a very nascent stage. So honestly, I would recommend to choose as a blockchain as a career path right away because it's still evolving. The opportunities are there. I'm not uh, denying the fact that with blockchain there are no opportunities for medical profession. Opportunities are, do exist. But when compared to technologies like data science and artificial intelligence, the job opportunities are very limited in the space of blockchain. It's still evolving. So probably. In, in, the, in the next year or a couple of years, so we will evolve and more job opportunities can be uh, will be emerging from the medical department. Right. Thanks a lot, Mr. Rab. Dr. Shinivas, over to you. Uh, so there are a lot of questions in terms of people are asking uh, what kind of background uh, uh, are the recruiters in healthcare looking at in terms of technology-based jobs in in the healthcare sector, if you can just highlight who all can apply for these job roles. Yes, yes. I think um, uh, a broad answer to this is like anyone who is a graduate and breathing oxygen can get into uh, the technology based jobs in healthcare. That means it's such a wide uh, uh, platform uh, for everyone. So I'll, I'll just give a few examples. Okay? If you look at typical um, software development in uh, the IT industry, okay, so there are the two models that they widely follow. One is a, a B-based software development B model, and uh, there's also a Scrum-based model. Okay, in both the models, okay, you will have the similar mix of human resources. When I say similar mix of human resources, you will have a, a software coder, whom you call, uh, whom you call as a, um, a software engineer, 
Uh, you will have a software tester who tests the product at various levels, uh, at various iterations of its release. And you will also have a domain expert who is actually giving, validating those requirements. Okay, the product which they are building, is it right for the market? So these are broadly the three. And then to manage all this resource, you have a project manager. Okay, so the role in development of artificial intelligence or data science products is also similar. Okay, what I mean by that is, uh, suppose if we have a requirement to build a automated CT scan reader. Okay, so for automated CT scan reader, you you have say hundred thousand CT scans uh, given to you, and then the CT scans have to be analyzed. So first. A code, a software engineer will start writing requirements and that, that requirements will be tested by the engineering tester as well as the clinical tester. That means you have a software engineer who is developing the code, who is on the job. A tester, a software tester is also on the job and the domain expert who is guiding both of them, which is right. Okay, he will be doing validation. So basically, and a project manager who is looking at budgets for it and everything. So it's typically the, the AI-based jobs, technology-based jobs in healthcare are very similar to the technology-based jobs in banking or technology-based jobs in typical IT companies. Okay, but here the domain expertise is clinician. So there are opportunities for doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, the lab technicians, the radiology technicians, and everyone from healthcare. You will definitely have that red carpet for the engineers who are actually building the product for the management project graduates who want to project manage this whole project learn about budgeting and things like that so the technology based jobs in healthcare are not typical it based technology jobs they are a blend of everyone okay so that's a broad uh, uh, answer from my side so you you we, that's the reason we want to train so when we train these people there'll be a different perspective each one of them gains a domain expert will understand what is the typical software development process, what is Python, what is Hadoop, what are these languages, what is coding and all. So as a doctor or as a nurse, they have zero knowledge about it, so they gain their understanding. An engineer joining this course, they will learn just like C-Shop.net, they are going to learn a new language, coding language, by which they can develop a product in AI, product in machine learning, and product in data science. A tester, you will get a new perspective of testing because it's a healthcare product. This is life critical. You really cannot go wrong with testing in a life critical product. Suppose if I'm testing 100,000 uh, CT scans and uh, if there's a misdiagnosis, now because instead of dependent on a radiologist who is reading my CT scan, I'm dependent on a software. So if the software is missing a brain tumor, okay, then it's a huge a question of life and death. So that's the reason the software testing and the clinical validation, the domain experts are very, very critical in this business. So this is very special. And uh, I am hoping that this will, the jobs are going to open up in a big way and we need to be prepared with skills. Mr. Ram, uh, as I believe, uh, uh, digital marketing is also one of the areas where Apollo MedSkills and XLR are collaborating. So could you please highlight what uh, digital marketing uh, would comprise of and how the students can get uh, benefited out of that sure so digital marketing as the name suggests you no know, marketing on the internet marketing digitally that is nothing but on the internet so normally we also encounter a lot of advertisements on youtube right that is also part of digital marketing and also on google so when you are searching for some product on google mobile within 15,000 uh, rupees or mobile within uh, 30,000 rupees, you see a lot of ads that will be populated on, on the Google uh, the search engine. And also when you go to various websites, these ads will haunt you, right? They will be chasing you. So normally we call it as target-based ads. So there are different ways of marketing your products or services on internet. So how this will be beneficial for marketing professionals, sorry, uh, healthcare professionals? Yes, of course. See, many of these healthcare professionals like physiotherapists or, uh, or people who are running labs, people who are self-employed in the space of uh, health domain, they, they have to market their services on internet. Now also you will see, for any doctor services, you are seeing Tracto, like you know, websites like Tracto. People are publishing their information in Tracto doctors and people are getting an online appointment, right? So for this kind of uh, 
marketing that to be done, a particular service or a particular hospital or particular physiotherapy center or a rehabilitation center, whatever you have been running, that you should do marketing on it. So with digital marketing, you'll understand the final nuances on how to market your service in your location or in your city where you are operating. Someone searches, no, uh, a dental hospital near me. Right? When someone searches a dental hospital near me, obviously your dental hospital should feature that Google Maps. They will show the results, right? Then only, see, normally it's a human tendency, like we open only the search results as to three, four, five maximum. You never go to second page or third page or fourth page and you don't see for a, a service or for a product. So our search will be limited hardly to four or five search results on Google or search engine for that matter, isn't it? So that way people uh, should uh, see how their service or their name or their hospital name is featuring the search results in the first page or in the first rank for that matter, right? Thereby they can generate more business. Or someone searches physiotherapy center near me. So if someone searches for a physiotherapy center, obviously their physiotherapy center, if it comes in the first in the search results, obviously they get more business. Or some, uh, someone wants to uh, provide some services, no, the doorstep services, be it lab testing, they want to go and do the door, doorstep services for the lab testing. So obviously digital marketing will be very, very handy. Remember, 80% of the business of late is happening only on internet through digital way now. The conventional marketing is considerably has come down and precipitously it is coming down over a period of time. Like uh, the conventional marketing, when I say your newspaper ad or uh, your holdings, your pamphlets, right? It is consider it's considerably it's decreasing. And now with the advent of internet in a big, very big way, so the need for uh, someone to know about this uh, digital marketing uh, uh, techniques so that uh, they can sell their products they can sell their services uh, on internet very very easily so being an entrepreneur or self employed empl uh, self employed uh, healthcare professionals digital marketing will be very very handy for them to build a career right. so that way digital marketing will be very helpful for these uh, uh, professionals as well yeah, uh, healthcare professionals as well or i mean uh, I, i'm not giving it as a uh, as a piece of advice which is recommended if you want to switch your career, if you see that your healthcare career is not so lucrative, it's not fruitful, you can become a data scientist or you can become a digital marketing expert. You can switch your career. I know it's not a recommended uh, suggestion to ask you to switch your career. But yes, if you find that your, your, there is a, a saturation or stagnation for your career opportunities or salaries or career path, then definitely uh, these technologies will be very handy completely to switch from your current domain of healthcare to into this one. Right. Thanks a lot, Mr. Ram. Uh, uh, Dr. Shirivas, uh, uh, how is Apollo Med Skills play a very important tool? So, so how is Apollo Med Skills uh, getting this uh, huge trade? Could you please elaborate on that? So, um, use for future skills jobs, okay, if you look at future skills in healthcare, they're both uh, technology-based future skills and non-technology-based future skills, and we are well prepared, I think, uh, this uh, two, about 90 days of lockdown has given us an ample time to um, introspect into our programs and also look at what the future needs. So, we have come up with um, a large number of programs, about uh, 15 of them, where we foresee a huge demand coming up. Um, in the technology side, the diploma in data science, the diploma in artificial intelligence, diploma in machine learning, and diploma in digital marketing. Uh, these are some of the areas where there could be a booming demand um, in the coming days. Then we have also started a program uh, uh, in uh, diploma in medical coding. We have started a course in telemedicine. Um, we have also added strong technology-based modules into our healthcare management programs. We do uh, postgraduate diploma in healthcare management and an executive MBA in healthcare management, where we have added the technology module. So the healthcare managers are expected to learn the, the technology aspects going forward. Uh, then uh, in non-technical side, uh, there'll be huge demand for geriatric aids. You see, there will be limited post-COVID, there's a limited move movement for uh, senior citizens about 65 years of age. So uh, we started training geriatric aids. 
uh, home health aides who have to deliver care. For example, today you must have read in the news that the Delhi government uh, is doing home isolation of patients because they don't want yes, to go in the hospitals. So there's a need for home health aides, someone who is trained to take care of patients at home. So these isolated patients are taken care at home. We anticipated this demand. We have trained a huge number of home health aides now, and we are able to deploy them with these. Um, there will be a need for telehealth coordinators, medical coders. So as I mentioned, so both on the technology side and the non-technology side, there will be used, uh, even the phlebotomy technicians who needs to screen the population. We need to screen people for COVID-19 in post the lockdown. So for that, you need a huge number of resources who will collect blood samples and test them. So there are a lot of opportunities on the future skill side, and we are well prepared. And uh, being a leader in the healthcare sector, Apollo Group always will be on the forefront. And uh, we are very um, glad that we partnered with XLR for our technology-based programs, uh, whether it is data science, AI, machine learning, uh, or a digital marketing, because they come with a huge experience. And uh, they, have, uh, they, have, they have a promise of delivery of these programs for quite some time. So uh, this is how we are prepared for future skills. Uh, Right. Thank you, Dr. Shrivas. So since uh, we are short on time, I'll just take one more question with Mr. Ram. In terms of what will be the uh, suggested workflow, Mr. Ram, from the student enrollment process to the certification on the programs offered by Apollo and XLR jointly? So the journey goes like this. Uh, once they get enrolled for the course, so the course starts with the basics. Since we know that the, the, the domain, the, the professions are from uh, non-technical domain. So we have designed the course in such a way that even a non-technical guy can absorb and assimilate the concepts very easily. So it starts with very basics. Basics of say basic statistics will be taught because statistics are, is required for, 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 the, for data science. Not only for data science, even for data analyst uh, job work as well. So any course that they get enrolled, we start from the basics. Let us say they get enrolled for digital marketing. So the, from very basics, the course will be the, the concepts will be taught. And this will be a complete hands-on session. So those, those some theoretical concepts are are explained and uh, elucidated, but most of the concepts what we teach will be hands-on. We make sure that people are getting their hands dirty, gain that hands-on experience. There will be daily assignments, there will be homework, and there will be a dedicated mentor for them to vet their homework. So to evaluate this homework, like how the class teacher does evaluate the homework of a student, very similar to that. Right, and we also plan, uh, we provide support through WhatsApp as well. So we create WhatsApp groups with all the enrolled participants, and the, the trainers will be part of this WhatsApp. So, in a way, the trainers, the students are just a WhatsApp away for, for any kind of support what they want. And be it online or classroom session, every session will be recorded where participants can revise and recap the concepts so they won't place in something else. Or even if they miss out any of the classes, they can watch these recorded videos and they are part of the NFB uh, with the other participants as well, other students as well. And once they complete the course, once they complete all the assignments, they will be working on capstone projects. Capstone project is a project which end to end. So when I say end to end, for example, if you take data science project, the entire data life cycle they'll be working upon. When I say data life cycle, how do you extract the raw data? How do you do, do the data cleansing, data structuring? Data cleansing is you have to clean unwanted data, right? Unwanted value. You have to clean it. Their uh, data set is major. A chunk of uh, time goes into this. And then subsequently, how do you structure the data the way you want? And then the data mining techniques. Right? And then subsequently, uh, the forecasting techniques, the predictions. Based on the historical information they analyze, they build the prediction models as well. They do the data modeling, they do the prediction, they build the prediction models. And also the last look is the data visualization. So likewise, in this project, they apply all the concepts, how they do it in a real time. In a, in a, let us say in an IT company or, or a non-IT company where they work with the data science projects, what are the steps they follow? They follow all these steps. You know, all the legs of this uh, project will be uh, ensured that you know, they're working on this. So that way, they, they gain that uh, uh, hands on experience. Let us say uh, the projects what uh, uh, Apollo Med School uh, students will be working will be on healthcare projects, like what are the application of data science that we take now, right? Analyzing the patient's data, right? Or chatbots to support the patients in the hospital. So, all this, any, any kind of application, this kind of project they'll be working upon, right? And also, we assist them in placement. When I say placement assistance, 
we help them in building their resume. We also train them on how to crack the interviews, right? Having knowledge is different, presenting that knowledge and showcasing your profile on job portals and making the profile more marketable is more important. And once you go for an interview, how to crack it, what kind of questions you can expect. And also we help them with the mock questions, right? mock interviews. We conduct the mock interviews, we highlight the gray areas where they need to pull up their socks and they should get ready. So from training till placement, we do a complete handling. It's not that we deliver the training and wash off our hands. We do a complete handling from training to placement. And in the context of this healthcare domain, the entire training will be done. Like if some examples related to finance domain is, is been given, people may not understand because people are from healthcare domain. So this completely is tailored uh, in the context of this healthcare domain. And we put to the, 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 the profiles are marketed within the market and we help them with the placement. Of course, Apollo has a has the tentacles spread across the industry, right? Being a giant in this uh, sector. So even from Apollo side also, uh, they will uh, reciprocate our approach. They will, they will also help in, in some sort of uh, placement. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Mr. Ram. So, uh, Dr. Shriva, there are a few questions. So one question has come from Kolkata, from a participant in Kolkata. Uh, that participant wants to know, what are the opportunities for biomedical engineers in the technology side? So biomedical engineers. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think biomedical engineers stand a good chance because um, they already uh, understand the biomedical aspect. And most of, if you look at the most of the medical device companies now, okay, they are hiring the biomedical engineers because of their knowledge both on biology as well as uh, uh, medical side. Uh, so in device development. So if you see some of these now in the new government regulations, even not just hardware. The softwares are also considered as medical devices. So they're coming up with a very clear distinction of which softwares are considered as medical devices. So given that context, the biomedical engineers can catch up this knowledge very quickly. And uh, I think there, there is a strong bridge between the medicine and the engineering side. And they once they learn the new technologies like data science, I think they will have definitive edge in acquiring jobs on the future jobs. Okay, they, they not just hardware science or the biology, they will also understand about the, the artificial intelligence, data science, and future technology. Right. So, uh, there's one question from Mr. Venu. Uh, so, Mr. Venu wants to know what kind of opportunities exist in the healthcare who, uh, for someone who has 15 years of experience in the programming side and also who has acquired data science knowledge here. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, uh, when that's a good question. I think uh, someone who has got 15 years of experience in programming, uh, I think the value addition that you get on this program is the domain knowledge. Uh, being, uh, you, I'm sure you will quickly acquire the coding knowledge of uh, AI and data science, um, but the added advantage would be the domain knowledge on healthcare, one. And second, being having 15 years of experience um, you will not get into a start level positions. You would be at a scrum master or a, a pro project manager level if you really have uh, also mastered those tools. So uh, given your experience, I think this is a, a good course to get into a domain shift. If you are in a particular domain and if you want to enter into healthcare domain in technology, I think this would be a good shift for you. And for everyone on the web has got significant experience uh, in coding and programming. Um, Mr. Ram, you want to add anything to this? Uh, I mean, in fact, it's a great advantage for him because he already has the, uh, the, the programming background with him. And of course, you know, the value addition, as you rightly said, it's a domain expertise, what he has, you know, the medical, the healthcare domain expertise. So it will be a deadly combination, uh, if you have to say. Right? Yeah, definitely. And yeah. even with the non technical background, uh, I saw one more question now uh, here. Mm -hmm. And can I just uh, put up one question in, in between? Uh, uh, Rodriguez, uh, there are queries from students who are asking, what is the process to join such courses? Like, how does it go about? Uh, the process of joining the courses is simple. Uh, if you are willing to join Apollo MedSkills XLR programs, you need to get into either Apollo MedSkills website or XLR website. Click on the link, and uh, it's uh, as easy as uh, making a Maggie. 
uh, so it's a one minute noodle kind of a buying okay so it's as simple as that uh, you make a decision you make a think about it uh, are you really seriously looking at a career shift are you looking at healthcare uh, as a market why you are looking at healthcare do you have that will to acquire the knowledge to my knowledge in healthcare and spend there please make a conscious decision yes buying this course is very simple either one of our um, kind of student counselor would reach out to you he's expert in ai and guide you on how to join this uh, once you make a decision i think uh, joining this course is very simple i promise you that uh, so get get on to our website and see the programs uh, you will know more details about that uh, specific details about qualification and um, experience and the duration of the course and things like that are available on the website www.apolomedskills.com right in fact we have already mentioned the uh, the email id on the screen so anybody wanting to have a free copy of the prospectus they can ask for that on this uh, email id or they can also call on the numbers so i think we have pretty much covered most of the questions uh, there's one more question dr shrinivas in terms of opportunities which are available for the healthcare managers so oh, please i think uh, yes we have crossed the timeline by a minute but i'll quickly answer this yes healthcare managers one of the efficiency of a healthcare manager depends on the data and when you have a control on this data okay and when you are able to populate your data on proper dashboards and you know what is a meaningful data and what is a non meaningful data i think healthcare managers learning this because most of the points that i touched upon were clinical but there are a lot of administrative quality cycle and technology benefits that ai can bring in when i say administrative benefit benefits you will be able to calculate what are the average waiting times in your hospital and benchmark it with the other hospitals uh, with the data you will know what is a kind of average length of stay what the bed turnover rate in your hospital um, how you can improve the efficiency uh, within your hospital so the data is not just adding value in saving lives but it is also adding value in improving your operations within the healthcare industry so that's what uh, this course aims at um so in whichever area you are you can you have data and you will know how to use it okay so the data science is going to help you healthcare managers as well thanks for asking the question uh i actually got a message from um uh, mr gv arthi acharya uh, thank you sir uh, thanks for giving this message good initiative uh, sir acharya is actually uh, he heads the college of healthcare management is hyderabad central university is a very very popular figure and a very renowned man thank you sir for joining this uh, conference and giving us this encouragement thank you so since uh, we are through with the one hour time duration dr shrinivas uh, i would like to thank all the participants and to you dr shrinivas and mr ram for taking this uh, very enlightening session anyone having any questions please call us at the numbers mentioned on the screen or they can mail their queries thank you thank you vishal thank you thank you thank you thank you